If you will, please open up your Bibles and turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. That's where we will be looking here in just a moment this morning. But before we do, we want to take this opportunity to once again welcome each and everyone here with us this morning. We're excited that we're able to come together. We're excited that we're able to open up God's Word and study it so that we are able to go and teach. It's not just so that we are able to to learn and and help us get to heaven, but it's so that we are able to teach others and help them. I asked Mr. Darrell on Wednesday if he would lead that song. He led it this past Wednesday in our singing night. I love that song. That's a very humbling song, isn't it? Asking us, have we mentioned Christ? Have we told the world about Christ? I ask you this morning to turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And the reason I ask you to is, one, that's the scripture that's at the top of the page of the song that we just sang. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. And it says, Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. That's a pretty big charge, isn't it? That this is what he told Timothy that he ought to do. This is what we ought to do. Take heed to the doctrine so that those who hear us will be able to be saved. This morning, before we begin, I want us to start off with a question. And we normally end with them. Let's, let's, let's start with one this morning. Are you, am I, willing to stand up? Am I willing to speak up for the truth? Am I willing to say the things that matter? Last week, last week we looked at denominationalism. We were able to look and find and see, scripturally speaking, why it is wrong why it is that we here are not part of a denomination we are part of the one church but in that study we looked at the teachings of baptism the the baptisms that these denominations and we only looked at five but we looked at their teachings i want us to refresh our minds on that just for a moment this morning I want us to refresh our minds and look and and be able to recognize the Catholics. They practice the the baptism, if you would like to use that phrase, of sprinkling, of pouring water over an infant's head. If we look at the Baptist church, they practice baptism. However, they do not believe and they do not teach that it is required for salvation. If we look at the Methodist church, they, they practice baptism. But yet what they teach baptism as, and what they teach it is, is that it's a recognition of God's grace. Is that it's us saying, we see the grace that God gives us. If you look at the Nazarene church, they believe that all types and all forms of baptism are okay. That there's no difference in them. And that what it truly is, or what they believe it truly is, is a decision to follow. They practice that it's an affirmation. And it's one that they can make time and time again throughout their life. They have these things that are called Baptist baptism parties. Where they come together and they say, we're going to reaffirm what we believe. Or if we looked at the, the Mormon church, the Latter-day Saints. They teach that it is indeed required for salvation. But that it in and of itself does not give you the remission of sins. That in order for that to happen, you have to be added to certain things. One of them being what they refer to as the holy priesthood, a decision made by their leaders. See, there are so many different types of baptisms that are taught today. But amongst amongst all of these, many teach that the details to them, the details to baptism, they teach, well, they don't really matter as much. They're not really as important as the faith that drives them. That's the part that actually saves us. That's what they teach. This morning, I want to ask this question. 
And it's not a question that just goes with baptism. But that's going to be our focus. It's a question that goes with all of Scripture. Do the details matter? Do the details of these things matter? Specifically speaking, as I said, we're going to look at baptism. So I worded it this way. Are all baptisms equal? Are they all the same? I think many, if not all, in this room this morning are already saying, well, no. And we could actually answer this very quickly and very easily this morning just by turning over to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, excuse me, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Pay attention to this last part here. He says, There is one body and one spirit. We looked at that last week. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, of God, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We could look at Ephesians chapter 4. We could look at verse 5 specifically and very quickly say, No. No, they're not all equal because Scripture tells us that there is one baptism. But you know what Scripture also teaches us? It also brings up many other baptisms that are brought up. It brings up numerous different types of baptism. We're going to look at a few of those this, few of those this morning. I'm going to ask you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that's where we're going to find the the first baptism that we're going to speak about this morning. It says, reading verses 1 through 5, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You know, when we talk about the one baptism, well, one baptism that's mentioned in the New Testament is the baptism of Moses. Is that the one? Is that the baptism that we are part of? And well, we can actually look at it and realize what was Paul doing? He was using this phrase, using this terminology, to teach them. To teach them about this salvation. But does that mean that this is the baptism we are in? Well, no. No, it's not. Why not? Because that rule, when they went through it, it doesn't fall under us, does it? It's not the same law. Well, let's look at another baptism. If you turn over to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, verses 38 through 40. It says, but Jesus said to them, speaking about who? Speaking about James and John, because they asked. They said, can we sit at your right hand and at your left? Jesus answers them. So Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared. You know, when we look at this, what baptism is? is Jesus talking about? Well, he's not talking about the baptism of John. That's already come and gone, isn't it? He's already been baptized by John. So what baptism is he talking about? The only one that we can find is, is that he's going to be immersed in suffering. He is going to be baptized in suffering. He tells both James and John, he tells them, you're going to suffer this too. But is this the baptism? 
I'd have to say no. I'd have to say this isn't the baptism. Here's why. Their suffering is different than my suffering, isn't it? What Jesus went through is different than what I went through. What the first century church went through. The prosecutions that they went through. Well, they're very much different than what I go through, aren't they? And so can they be the one baptism? No, because they're not the same. When we look at this, what we find is that they are there to, to help understand. They are there to help edify James and John and now us. So that we are able to understand, simply speaking, no, it's not the one baptism. Well, what about the baptism of John? One that, as we look at, is very similar to the baptism of Jesus. But what does it tell us in Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 8? It tells us John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Then all the land of, of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, it's important what he says here. He says, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John in and of himself admits, I'm not the one baptism. He in and of himself admits that there is another one coming whose baptism is greater than mine. As we look at that, we're able to recognize, no, this isn't the one baptism. This baptism was, was there to prepare a way for Jesus. We can look over in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26, and we can see once again, just to help us reaffirm the, the truth that is taught here. You see, Aquila and Priscilla... They met a man named Apollos who was teaching. Well, what was he teaching? He was teaching the baptism of John. They took him aside. They taught him a more accurate way. He taught what he knew. They increased what he knew. What we can recognize is just like we've already said for, for all of these so far. It's not the one baptism. Let's look at another and now in Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 through 12, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me, who is mightier than I, whose sandal I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And we see the baptism of fire mentioned here. Many today, when they talk about it, what they, they say it is, is, well, this is when the apostles had the Holy Spirit come upon them like fire. Contextually speaking, that doesn't make any sense. And here's why it doesn't. Because as we looked in verse 12, what's he talking about? He doesn't talk about a fire that comes down for good. He talks about a fire that comes down to what? To destroy the chaff. To destroy that which is not good. What fire is he talking about? He's talking about the baptism of eternal punishment. Immersion into eternal punishment. An unquenchable fire. A baptism of hell. Clearly, not the one baptism. Because the one baptism we refer to, that we're baptized into, does what? Well, it doesn't destroy us, it saves us. Well, what about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now, this is a phrase that many use today, and many will say, well, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does the Scripture teach us about that one? In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in, Ju in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He talks about the Holy Spirit baptizing the apostles. Coming down upon the apostles, falling on the apostles. If you go down to Acts chapter 2, we look in verse 4. What we see is that this promise comes true. It says in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We see another example of when the Spirit came down and landed upon others in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. This is when, this is when Cornelius is converted. Now let's see what it says there, though. It says, beginning in verse 44, it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, astonished as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water? That's an important verse. He says, Can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. The Holy Spirit fell down upon those who were present, upon those who believed. It showed what? It showed that the Gentiles indeed were part of the chosen. But is that what saved them? Is that the baptism that added them to the church, which we're going to look at here in a moment? Well, absolutely not, because what does Peter say? He says, can you forbid them water? Can you say that they can't be baptized? Oh, see, the, the Holy Spirit fell upon the house of Cornelius, and all those who were present who believed prior to them being saved. Prior to them being baptized. Clearly, not the one baptism well let's look at one more we find in Romans chapter 6 one more that we find over in Romans chapter 6 reading verses 1 through 6 it says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound certainly not how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as a, of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly... We also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Does this sound like the one baptism? Well, it does, doesn't it? The baptism in which we are able to put the old man to death. The baptism in which we are able to be raised so that we can walk a new life. A life that is not burdened with the sin that we had committed, but that we have been forgiven of. As we find over in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, as Peter told all those who were present, who asked, what shall we do? Well, what did Peter tell them? He didn't tell them, we'll have the Holy Spirit come down upon you. He said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. That's what he told them. That is part of the one baptism. We also see that as they were baptized in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, they were added to the church daily. And about on that day, about 3,000 souls were added to the church. Now, as we look at it, the baptism into Christ is very clearly the one baptism, isn't it? It's very clearly the baptism in which we are baptized into. So I ask again. Are all baptisms equal? You know, the Bible doesn't even 
doesn't even say that there's only one that's ever mentioned. And even it shows and teaches us that all these baptisms we talked about this morning are not the same. They are not equal. That's the baptisms that are taught amongst denominations around the world today, they're not equal. And it's important for us to recognize. It's important for us to see very clearly the details of this matter. The details of the scripture matter. And it's not something for us to look at and for us to, to shake off. Or for us to say, oh, we'll just agree to disagree. I hate that statement, by the way. I absolutely do. Because for me to say I agree to disagree, it means, okay, well, you just go about living your life. I'll condone it. That's what it means to me. That's what I hear when I say that phrase. We have to be willing to stand up and say the details matter. It matters when we look at these denominational baptisms. It matters because they still claim to be doing it in the name of Christ. They still claim that they are doing it and they are part of the one baptism. Well, Scripture teaches us otherwise, though, doesn't it? Because in order for them to do it by the authority of Christ, they have to do it in the manner in which Christ said to do it. They have to do it understanding what it is that they are doing. And the first part of that is they have to recognize, well, there is only one. There is only one way for us to be baptized. There's only one authority given for us to be baptized. In order for us to be a part of it, we have to recognize and realize. I can't just say that because I think it's okay, that makes it okay. I can't just say that, well, you know, I, I, I thought it was more convenient for me, so it's okay. You know, I was thinking about a way to put this that's not talking about baptism. That's not talking about the order and the things in which we do to be baptized. And I came up with, with only one, and that's starting a car. If someone goes out and they're, they're going to start a car that hadn't been driven in years, there are certain things they have to do, isn't there? They have to make sure that the, the battery is good, that it has a charge. They have to make sure the battery is connected. And they have to make sure that the car has gas in it, don't they? And then after they do all of these things, then they can go and turn the key. Well, there's different steps. There's different things they have to do. What happens? If somebody goes out to that car and they say, okay, we have gas, let me turn the key. And they forget to, to connect that battery. Nothing happens. Absolutely nothing. Well, then they say, well, well, I thought it was okay. I mean, went back, I checked the battery after. I mean, I thought it was okay, but was it? Did they accomplish the goal that they set out to use? If we go about, or if they go about trying to, to do things the way they want, and they say, well, I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay for me to, to be baptized in this manner or to think it means this, thinks it means that. Does Scripture teach us that's okay? It doesn't. What the Scripture teaches us is that there are certain requirements for the one baptism. There's a way that we do it. And there's a very specific way. And there's a very specific meaning behind it. The first thing that we have to do is we have to be immersed. Many today teach sprinkling. They teach pouring. But you know what word is never found when it talks about baptisms? Baptiste dope which would have been for sprinkling or pouring. Baptismo is used for immersion. Scripture makes it clear. 
to make it clear that what we need to do is be immersed. And so if we go or if there are those who, who aren't immersed, it's not possible to be part of the one baptism. Or what if you go and you, you teach that, well, I'm baptized and I'm doing it to, to recognize God's grace. It's not required for salvation. I do it for something else. What if you believe and you teach that, well, I can be saved without baptism as long as I believe and have faith. And then you're baptized. It's not the one baptism. Because you aren't recognizing and seeing what that baptism truly is doing for you. You don't see what it does for you. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. A verse that we use, a verse that many denominations use today to try and teach their error. It tells us what it says. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, and whoever does not believe shall be condemned. It tells us simply we have to believe and be baptized. It doesn't say he who believes is saved and then be baptized later. It tells us what we have to do. It tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that we have to realize, we have to know what this baptism is doing for us. It's for salvation, and it's for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where we already looked at. Many today, they teach that, that baptism, it's not for the remission of sin. We're baptized because our sins are forgiven. That just doesn't make any sense, does it? Because those who are saved, they are saved because their sins are forgiven through the blood of Christ. And as we look at this one baptism, the most important part of it is that we have to recognize the authority behind it. And the authority behind it is never what Jason thinks, it's never what Tad thinks or Daryl or anybody else in this room or anybody else on this earth the authority is, what did Christ teach? What did the apostles teach by the authority of Christ? And what they taught is to be immersed for the remission of sins unto salvation. I want us to end this morning, though, not talking about baptism. Sounds kind of weird, but it's true. I don't want to end talking about this. I want to end where we actually began. We began this morning by talking about teaching others. We know, we know that there is a problem in the world today, don't we? We see a problem in the world today of false teachers, of error being taught. Are we standing against it? When we see error being taught, do we teach the truth? When we see areas where the truth isn't being taught at all, when there's no error being taught, when there's no truth being taught, do we find a way to go and teach? That song that we sang, it should be humble. Because what we're told in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, Jesus tells his disciples there, he tells them to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus tells his disciples to go and teach. A simple command. Are we following it? Do we go and teach? Do we teach people how it is that we become part of Christ? Do we teach people when maybe it's not always convenient? We talked about Aquila and Priscilla this morning. We talked about the fact that they heard of Paulus teaching. And so what did they do? They said, well, he's pretty close. I'll walk away. 
No, they went and taught him more accurately the way of the truth. Sometimes it might not be convenient. Sometimes we might actually have to correct somebody who we hold respect for. But does that mean we don't correct them? Absolutely not. Paul, over in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, he recounts when he had to go and rebuke Peter. Because Peter was living hip hypocritically. We have to be willing to teach even when we might not want to because if we don't, if we choose that, well, it's not convenient for me right now or I really don't want to deal with that confrontation right now, we don't like confrontation, do we? But if we look at it and say, I don't want to deal with it, what we're really saying is I'm refusing to teach. I'm refusing to do what the scripture tells me to do. You know what that does? It doesn't make our life easier. It condemns. Period. And the saddest part is that it doesn't just condemn me. We'll look at that in a second. It condemns those who I refused to teach. Over in, in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16. It says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. Pay attention. Verse 14. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ. If we refuse to teach those, one, who haven't heard, two, who are teaching error, we're leaving them to be tossed to and fro. We're leaving them so that the world's trickery and its craftiness can continue to have a hold on them. That's what we leave them for. We leave them to be condemned. But like I said, it's not just them. It's us too. We condemn ourselves when we refuse to teach. Over in James chapter 4 verse 17. It says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If we know that we ought to teach, if we know what the scripture teaches and yet we say, not in the mood today, that's sin. The lack of doing, that's sin. We need to be teaching. We need to be out there. We need to stand for the truth. We need to stand for those details that we talked about. This morning, now let's look at a few more questions. I asked Mr. Darrell to also leave, what will your answer be? And here's the reason I ask. If he were to come back now, if Christ were to return now, what would our answer be? Can we say without doubt that we stand for the truth in the face of false teaching, in the face of discouragement? Do we stand for truth? Do we teach the truth? Can we say that we are doing all that we can to spread the truth? We have some wonderful Biblical examples. I'm sure we have wonderful examples of, of men today who they're out and they're teaching. Can we say I'm doing all that I can? That I'm using all the talents and all the abilities that I have been given to go and teach? Can we say that we are making disciples in the name of Jesus? 
See, I can't answer these questions for anybody but me, can I? I can't say what the answer is going to be for, for Kathy. I can't say what it's going to be for Miss Kathy, but Mr. Daryl, Marvin, Miss Jennifer, none of them. But look at ourselves. Look at our own life and say, what's that answer going to be? This morning, the lesson is yours. And if you need to come forward, if you need to be added to the body of Christ, and the only way that we can is through the one baptism. If you need to be baptized into that this morning, we ask you to do so. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Don't procrastinate. Think that maybe there's a better time because there's not. Come forward. Be baptized. Or maybe you need to, to make a public confession of sin that we're committed to public. We have an opportunity to do so. And maybe we might think to ourselves, well, I need a little bit more strength in order to do it. Maybe we think to ourselves, I need a little bit more guilt before I get up there and do that. Well, you know what I, I can say is that I don't think anybody hasn't had to do that before. I don't think that's something that anybody has faced and said that uh, I don't need to. The strength that comes is strength that we have together. Because we are united in truth. Or maybe you need prayers. Maybe you need the brethren here to help. We desire to pray for one another. We want to bear the burdens of one another. But the only way that's possible is for us to know. And some of us are pretty good at hiding stuff. Some of us are pretty good at bearing those things. If you need prayers, if you need whatever it is this morning, come forward as we stand and as we sing.